Hello everyone, welcome to this edition of In the Community, I'm Jennifer Beck. Today's guest grew up watching TV 44. In fact, her family started watching TV 44 on day one of our broadcast. But that's not the focus of our interview. Our focus is what God is doing through her life and in turn, how God is using her life to impact others. Dr. Katrina Forsyth is the State Director for Child Evangelism Fellowship in Illinois. During a recent trip back to her home place here in Northwest Ohio, Katrina came to the TV studio to talk about her new book, but even more than that, talk about how Jesus, our Savior, can be recognized all the way back in Genesis. It's great to have Dr. Katrina Forsyth back in the studio. It's been several years since she's been here. State Director for Child Evangelism Fellowship, CEF, in the state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. But you grew up right here in Ohio, right? Yes, I'm a Northwest a uh, Midwest farmer's daughter's girl, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we're gonna talk about uh, the book that Dr. Forsyth has published recently, but before we get to that, let's just jump way back because you are living in Illinois. We don't have a lot of Illinois residents on our shows very often, but we definitely want to have you here because you did grow up in Ohio mm -hmm. and you grew up watching TV 44. Tell me where you grew up, where your parents are, and the connection mm -hmm. you have here with the TV station. Well, I grew up in Forest, Ohio, which is, if people don't know where that's at, that's uh, near Upper Sandusky. And my dad's a farmer, so I grew up, that's how I grew up in the country, I'm a country girl. And, but I grew up uh, going to Child Advance and Fellowship Good News Clubs mm -hmm. ever since I was three years of age. Uh -huh. And so that's kind of my history and my background. And also my mother was a volunteer with Child Advance and Fellowship. And back in the day, um, in the 1970s, that dates me a little bit, <laughs> um, you could actually walk right into the public school during the school day. Mm. You didn't have to do after school good news clubs. You didn't have to do release time. You could go right, isn't that awesome? Mm. And so for all the years growing up, um, my mother and other ladies and the communities, all part of the CF volunteer network, they came in every day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and they taught all the grades for probably about 10, 12 plus years. And so I grew up with all my public school friends telling them, uh, them telling me that my mom was a Jesus lady. So <laughs> it's kind of a little bit hard to live up to. Um, so that's kind of my background uh, growing up in CEF. And then when I was kind of fast forward to high school, I served as a summer missionary with Child Advancement Fellowship. And I found out later um, that I never heard heard that there was a uh, like a backyard Bible club thing that CF did, and the reason why is I found out because I was the first summer missionary and my friend to do it in Northwest Ohio, and at that time we did the Hardin, Hancock, Wyandotte County, but we went to Cedarville uh, University to be trained. Not that I was in college when I was in high school, but that's just where the training school was held mm -hmm. at. And also from Lima, Ohio, uh, Faye Stevens mm -hmm. was on staff with CEF and she helped train me too. And so that's kind of my background. That's how I grew up and just went from there, graduated Moody and so forth and so on and landed in Illinois. So. Yeah, how did you get to Illinois? <laughs> okay, well, I went to Moody Bible Institute. So Moody in is in Chicago. Right. And a lot of times we don't always like to say Chicago and Illinois go together, but they actually... No, it's part of. <laughs> and so I was there for four years and I got my undergraduate in a bachelor's in Bible theology. I met my husband and, um, and then we went to CF training school in Missouri. And I really wanted to go on to get my master's in Christian education. So I went down to Columbia, South Carolina to Columbia mm -hmm. International University. And then I was there and I just, like I was doing my master's at the same time I was on staff with CEF. So I was like, full-time wife, uh, full-time student, and also like 30 hours a week with CEF. And so I, they asked me probably within a year that I was down there when I was working on my schooling to uh, work towards becoming the local director. So I was down there for seven years. And um, then I just uh, was, I got a call from our CEF USA and they asked me to come up to Illinois to be the state director. So it really was a calling. And um, that's where the Lord has had me for the past 23 years serving as a state director. And so all together we have about 25 missionaries on staff, uh, field workers. Um, I don't know if you know much about Illinois, but there's Rockford, some of the bigger cities. Of course, Peoria is where I'm at, uh, Springfield, Decatur area, Quad Cities, Joliet. 
Um, I don't oversee Chicago. There's another person that's an executive director that's like me that oversees Chicago because Chicago is so big. <laughs> There's like eight, nine million people in Chicago. And so I have what's called the downstate. So in other, other words, everything outside of Chicago <laughs> is what my responsibility is. But also not just overseeing our current missionaries, but also developing the missionaries uh, ministry work. And so we just started a brand new work in Southern Illinois, mm. in Carbondale. And Southern Illinois reminds me so much of of Southern Ohio, just the rolling hills and like Mohegan area and stuff like that. And so we just started that and it, we went from zero to now we're in almost 20 schools with the after school good news clubs. And then we just started a new work in Springfield and now we're working on East St. Louis. So Missouri borders us. <clears throat> and so we're working on that side as well. Wow. Well, we talked before we started the interview a little bit about the LifeWise Academies because you saw the vehicles in our in our parking lot and you probably at home know that we're involved in many LifeWise Academies through the Axe Character Academy. So listening <clears throat> to you talk about the number of schools you're in, it just mm -hmm. makes me think about the enormous number of kids who are being impacted with the gospel mm -hmm. because of all of this work. Yeah, pre-COVID, we were in almost 100 elementary schools. <sighs> And so, but COVID crushed us a little bit. And so we're still recovering from that. So we went from, um, I'm not sure how it was in Ohio, but in Illinois, we were greatly impacted mm -hmm. our ministry. I mean, we're basically, we were shut out, you know, in March, I think it was March 13th, 2020, and just bam, 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 all the schools. Mm -hmm. And then it took a while and it's still, so we're only back up to 50% mm -hmm. of what we were before pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Lord is doing, I mean, we just like, for example, um, I can't necessarily name the school district, but we had a principal that reached out to one of our new staff that, that we were working with and they said, we need God in our schools. Mm -hmm. And they said, can you help us? And so we're like, yes. Mm -hmm. And so then we went and we talked to the superintendent and they met with their board. And so we just got that district opened up. And so, I mean, we're seeing God is moving. You know, it's not as moving as what I'd like to see, fast as I'd like to see. But uh, so we do after school good news clubs during the school year and the summertime. We do those backyard Bible clubs just like I did when I was a teenager. <laughs> and also we have a camp ministry and the camp ministry has been there close to 70 years. And by the way, the camp ministry has been there before I was there. So, <laughs> And so we reach about maybe about 300 children that come to our overnight camp ministry in the summertime. So we are just now wrapping up and finishing our summer ministry. So just in the summer ministry alone, we'll reach about 3,000 children. Mm -hmm. And uh, and before COVID, we were reaching close to nine, 10,000 children yeah. for our, the whole state, so. So I can understand the frustration, but God is rebuilding. And yes. And that's the good thing. It's, yes. it's not over, it's just changing. Yes, that's right. Yeah, and before we talk about the book, I, I just wanna to touch on a word you mentioned. You mentioned the word missionaries. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times when we think about missionaries, we think about an overseas mission. That's what missionaries mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. But you know, you talk about being a missionary. You have mm -hmm. so many missionaries on staff and that's really a part of it. We are missionaries where we are and that's what you have right there in the mm -hmm. CEF min ministry. The ministry of Child Evangelism Fellowship anywhere in the world, whether it's USA or overseas, all the, the all the staff, they have to raise their, their support. Just like if they were with, with crew, what used to be called Campus Crusade for Christ. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, they, they you know, we, we ask God and we tell us people, we don't get government grants or things like that. It's churches that support our ministry and individuals, donors. Um, and you know, it's so amazing that I have people that support me even to this day, that support me way back mm -hmm. when I was in high school doing mm -hmm. CEF five day clubs. So now they're getting older now, yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and, and Lord has added to that, but there's, it's just such a blessing that there's like, in part of it too, like I came here and I'm visiting my family and so forth, but I got to visit one of my home churches that have supported me all these years. And just to see the connections that go way back you know, and how those people, they've just been praying for me, encouraged me, and they just, they poured into my life all those years. And I just want to be a blessing back to them. That's great. That's great. God's people come together. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, it's niche. a team. Yeah. And it doesn't change. No. He knits people together in we such a wonderful way. We need the body of Christ. It's, it's not missionaries over here. You need, it's everyone together that, it's the Great Commission and it's for everybody. There's a place for everybody. Yes, absolutely. Well, let's talk about your book, which is, also has a great place in what you're doing. It's called Gospel Pictures of the Promised One in Genesis, written by Dr. Katrina Forsyth. 
and this came out earlier this year, is that correct? Yes, in January. In January, but it was a lot more than just January to get it here. You <laughs> worked for several years on this. Tell me behind the scenes what, what, what got you here, and then we'll talk about the book. Well, it was a long trek, and I'll try to shorten it, but it was 16 years to get my doctorate. 16 years. 16 years. It's not really a thing that I want to just go around. I almost want to tell people 16 years. <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, if someone asks you your golf score, like, oh, I shoot about a 70 or 80 for the back nine. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, it just took me a while. And I, I started when my son was two years old, and he wow. is 18 now, to give you a perspective how long that took me. So I had a couple of starts and stops and restarts, and um, I'm just so thankful that the, the seminar I worked with, that they, uh, Masters uh, International University, that they would allow me to keep on, keep on trucking, even though I had some little stops there. Um, but I just, one thing that was kind of intimidating me, it really wasn't the classwork, I was kind of clipping along with all those, uh, the studies and so forth, but when I came to that doctorate dissertation, I just felt like I was like climbing Mount Everest, and I was like, what am I going to write my thesis on? And then I remembered that in my childhood is I always, even though, you know, I went to good news clubs all my life and church and Sunday school, VBS, actually two VBSs, mm -hmm. you know, camp, Bible camp and Camp El Dioco down in Mansfield, Ohio and so forth. And, but I just, I just had a hard time understanding how the two parts of the Bible fit together. And I, I even remember a time in my life when I tried to read the Bible on my own and I decided I was going to start with Genesis and no one told me to do this. I just, before I went to bed at night, I would just, you know, read verse and then I write down what I thought that verse. I started in Genesis 1-1 and mm -hmm. I went through Genesis chapter 1, so forth, Genesis, Exodus. And As I, a teenager? Yeah, no, this or was when I was fifth and sixth grade. Fifth and sixth grade. Okay. Ten, like maybe 11, 12 yeah. years of age. And so this has been like, a, like, like embedded in me for mm -hmm. a very long time. I just wanted to understand how this whole thing connects together. Because I didn't understand how these like stories in the Bible connects to Jesus. Like even like this, the, like the song we were singing in children's church of Father Abraham. I remember thinking as a child, like go oh, right hand, left hand, turn around. I was like, what does Abraham have to do with Jesus? I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to like fault any of my teachers or anything. I just, I just didn't understand, you know, not only what does Abraham have to do with Jesus, but what does Abraham have to do with me? Mm -hmm. And what does Abraham have to do with John three sixteen? I just, those are some of the struggles I had. It's like, almost like you had all these stories and then it come to New Testament and then pop, you get a surprise Jesus. So anyways, on my own, I was trying to read and then I hit the third book of the Bible, Leviticus, <laughs> and I was like, I don't understand this book. <laughs> I was like, there's an Ofer here and then an Ephod over here. And I was like, ah, and I just went zip, zip with my vinyl zipper Bible and I just put it in the dresser drawer and I said, I quit. <laughs> enough, huh? yeah, enough. And, too confusing. Yeah, it's too confusing. My brain can't do it. Yeah, but then, you know, again, fast forward, then after uh, uh, the Lord just really got a hold of me when I was 15 and then, then I did CF my 16, 17, sophomore, junior year, and then I went to Moody. And that's why I wanted to major in Bible theology. I just really wanted to understand the, the you know, I was understanding the whole of the parts and parts of the whole. And I'm just so thankful for that education I received at Moody Bible Institute. But then I landed in my seminary work and, um, and that was in the next school I went to. And I had some professors, they knew I was on staff with CEF and they, they kind of came up, they challenged me a little bit and they said, why does Child Evangelism Fellowship, why do they like bring out Jesus like everywhere in the Bible, including in the Old Testament when Jesus wasn't even, you know, on the scene yet because he hadn't been born yet in the Gospels yet. And it really isn't about that. This is a very good school and I want to be mm -hmm. very careful. How I say. It's a very good school. It's a gospel centered school. It really was a fancy dancy where it was hermeneutics. It was a methodology of how you bring out the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so we just had, you know, we had to agree to disagree a little bit there, but I really wasn't quite understanding what they were saying. And I didn't really understand how to respond. I was a little intimidated, like mm -hmm. three doctors come and talk, talk to you. <laughs> So that just, again, that was another seed that got planted in right, there. Right, and so yeah. then fast forward, I was in Illinois now as a state director and I was just casually almost like sitting something like this and I was reading my, my Bible, doing devotions and it was Luke 24 on the Emmaus Road and it was on Resurrection Sunday because that's when all that, you know, Jesus rose from the dead um, and then, you know, with the women at the tomb. This was mm -hmm. Resurrection Sunday, you know, the, our first Easter. Right. And so Jesus is walking on the Emmaus Road. Actually, you know, he comes alongside those two men that were 
and they're asking him questions and saying, you know, don't you know what's happened? I think it's amazing here. Mm -hmm. there, Jesus is right there and their eyes are withholding. They don't see Jesus <laughs> and, and understands him. But here they're explaining to Jesus what had happened to Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and don't even realize that they're talking to Jesus. <laughs> yes, exactly. And then Jesus interrupts them and it's around uh, verse 25 and 26 in Luke 24. And Jesus says, oh, fools. Now, that's not very, you know, what we really want to hear that Jesus says to us. But he says, and this is a paraphrase, he says, oh, fools, to believe all the prophets and to not understand that the Messiah, the promised one, the mm. Christ, would suffer first and then enter into his glory. And then that next verse, Luke, the author, he makes a commentary note and he says, basically, and then beginning at Moses and then all the prophets and in all the writings, mm that Jesus, he explained to them how it all testifies to him. Mm -hmm. Now stop there. What is the first five books of the Old Testament? That is called the Pentateuch. Right. That is called the right. Law of Moses. Mm -hmm. And it actually, it's kind of a play on the words. It says, beginning at Moses. What's the very first book of the Bible? Genesis. What does Genesis mean? It means beginning. Mm -hmm. So actually what Jesus was saying to their Jewish ears, beginning at the beginning, beginning in Genesis and all the law, the five books and all the prophets, that's basically all the rest and all the writings, including the Psalms and the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. So in other words, what we would call the Old Testament, they would never call the Old mm -hmm. Testament. What, they're, what Jesus is saying to them, he's saying in a very technical way, he's saying what you call the law, the prophets and the writings, uh, he's saying all that, that Hebrew uh, Old Testament canon, that all that, the first 39 books of the Bible, he says, is all pointing to me. So mm -hmm. here's Jesus on basically the crossroads of history is looking back on Resurrection Sunday. And he is telling us that it's not just a good thing to look and see how the Old Testament points to him. He's saying it's required ah. to do so. Mm -hmm. I was like, where's those professors at? <laughs> but so that, that just really helped me to understand. And there's, there's more behind that, but how the whole Bible is really a hymn book. It's, mm. it's all about him. <laughs> the whole Old Testament is saying he's coming. You know, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are together in unison. They're saying he's here. Mm. The book of Acts is proclaiming him. All the epistles, the letters are like the apostles of Paul is explaining him yeah. and the last book of the bible the book of revelation is saying what he's coming again <laughs> it's it's all about him from beginning to end and so that got me to start under looking and say you know what there's there's not just prophecies in the old testament there's these gospel pictures and that's kind of how that set me on that on that road and i bet that was exciting when you started seeing all of that come to life all of those things that have been going through your mind that god had been planting yeah and now it all started to go together because here we have in the book every every chapter talks about an account of something that we understand well that we've read if mm -hmm. anybody who's read the bible they know these these accounts i don't like to call them stories because they're real they really happened these accounts in scripture mm -hmm. um, right from the beginning you talk about the importance of gospel pictures of the promised one in genesis but then when you get into chapter two and chapter three and go on it it, it starts to all those accounts. We have Noah, we have Abraham, mm -hmm. we have Isaac, we have all of those things and you are showing not just your own mind. I mean, you've got, you have a lot of footnotes here <laughs> that go where you yeah. found all of the, the information to come mm -hmm. together to, I did, to talk about this. I did a deep dive about 50 different resources and it took me about two years to research it and then also writing. So it was really a year and a half of researching it. But really, you know, I wish I would have been on that Mayus Road because I've been taking notes fervently. <laughs> you know, what are you saying here? Because, I mean, he didn't have time to go through. There's no way Jesus in, in a seven mile, you know, they say about two and a half, three hours it takes to do seven miles. There's no way he could have hit every single verse in the whole Old Testament. Uh. Not this, he was probably hitting the, the, you know, the mountain peaks, the highlights. But you have to go back to Genesis, even Genesis 3.15, where you had the first promise of the promised one where when sin came into the world, the promise of the promised one was right there. Mm -hmm. the, the promise the, to take care of the problem of sin, Satan, and death is that, that here's the Lord God. And actually that's a picture of Christ right there. Mm -hmm. That is the second person of the Trinity. That's a pre-incarnate Christ, the Lord God himself. So here you have sin coming into the world and our savior is right there. Mm -hmm. So they get a glimpse of the savior who will one day come. Mm -hmm. and will come as a seed of the woman who will come into the world and they will crush 
the serpent head, which is Satan, and by how will we do it? By crushing, by allowing himself to suffer, by his heel being bruised. And we would not be wrong by thinking of the cross either there. Mm -hmm. And also Isaiah 53 then backs that up and unravels it and says that, that the righteous suffering servant was bruised was crushed for our iniquities. And actually the word bruise actually means crush. That same word mm. that's all the way back in Genesis 3.15. So this one who will come through the seed of the woman will be human born. So it's not gonna drop in the sky or an alien or something like that. It's gonna be born, I don't care what the world says, there's only two genders, there's male and female. And the only way you get here is through, through the seed of the woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so it's gonna be one who is human born, but even that inference of seed of the woman is an inference of, of like a gospel nugget there. This one that will be human born is gonna be born in a special way. Mm -hmm. And we would not be wrong to think of, and a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then in Matthew, when Jesus is born, it says they shall call his name Jesus. And then Matthew, the gospel Matthew, then it cites Isaiah 7, 14. Mm. And Isaiah is also wrapped up in that <laughs> nugget of Genesis 3, 15. But this one who is human born, that's born in a special way, is going to come and crush the head of the serpent Satan. But how will we do that? By allowing himself to be crushed, by allowing himself to be bruised. And so through crushing, he will crush. And there is the first promise mm of the promised one who will one day come. So, I mean, it's just- In Genesis 3. In Genesis Way 3, back 15. in Genesis 3. In Genesis 3. And then just a couple verses later, uh, you, you have this beautiful picture of the clothing that God clothes Adam and Eve with. This is not just a physical clothing. This is not God s saying, you know, I just don't feel fig leaves today or something like mm -hmm. that. Is there was real sin. And God had already told Adam and Eve, the day that you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will surely what? You will surely die. die. And so even though they physically began to die and they also spiritually, they were separated from God, but also there was supposed to be a real penalty for the sin. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, that's what Satan was messing with Eve with and says, oh, mm -hmm. you won't surely die. No, what God said, you know, he was going to do. But instead of them finding death at the tree, which they deserved mm -hmm. because they, they disobeyed God, they found mercy at the tree, mm -hmm. in the same way we find mercy yeah. at the tree. But so, but God deemed it was just, instead of them being zipped and zapped right there at the tree, that one who was innocent, one who was without sin, that had nothing to do with what happened at the tree, could assume their penalty, their punishment for their sin, for their disobedience. Mm -hmm. And then with that one who was innocent, that had nothing to do with the tree, mm -hmm. with their blood shed, with their innocent life given for them on their behalf was now covering them. Yeah. You see, that is the gospel right there. Second Corinthians 5, 21 says, for he, God hath made uh, Christ to be sinned for us who knew no sin that we might mm -hmm. be made the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus not only assumed our sin, he also became sin for us, but he not only took our mm -hmm. sin, but he then, then covers us with his perfect righteousness. I had a pastor in South Carolina that said it way better than I ever could. He says that Christ not only loved you enough to suffer and to die six hours on the cross for you, mm -hmm. Christ loved you enough that he lived every day perfectly for you to be the perfect sacrifice for our sin. So I, I'm not sure if I, the, the bottom line is that Christ assumed our sin. He took our sin as our sin bearer, but then he covers us with his righteousness. Mm -hmm. So every day, I can be in a right relationship with God and will be so for eternity, not because anything I've said or, or done or not done, but all because of what Christ, my sin bearer, mm -hmm. who lived that perfect life for me has done. Now, where does that image come from of the gospel? that we can ha be covered with the righteousness of God in Genesis 3. In Genesis, and that's what you find in this book, which we're, we have just a few more minutes left in, uh, in our show. We'll tell you how to get this book when we're done. But I am just thinking as I listen to you talk, it had to be so exciting, like light bulbs everywhere as you started putting all the pieces together and seeing the gospel come out in Genesis over and over mm. and over again. I was like, this is God's word. Now, I knew that before. <laughs> I mean, you know, as obviously I believe in God's word. But since every, I was I know, every time but I, I read, mean, it, it's something new to me. I I, there's no other book that I own that I can read over and over again and I, I get something new and fresh and exactly what I need every mm -hmm. single time. These, these gospel pictures are prophecy in picture form. Mm -hmm. 
but it's like even like Mount Moriah with Abraham and Isaac and that ram on the, I mean, that was basically a, a pre a reenactment of Calvary that would happen 2,000 years later. And, mm -hmm. and bottom line uh, also is Mount Moriah is the same area where Calvary was. <laughs> a lot of people, I mean, it truly was, you know, we had Abraham, the father, Isaac, the son, and the substitute lamb. I mean, but these gospel pictures, I guess what I was wanted to just to, to just share with you is that when I was doing that study where you said the light bulb's coming on, is I was like, wait a second, there's no way that this could be happenstamps. There's no mm -hmm. way that you can have 40 different authors over a period of 1600 years of the writing from Genesis to Revelation. There's no way they could just, just you know, come together like they, you they couldn't have had a Zoom meeting and no, talked about it ahead of time no. and figured it out. And so this and, is you know. embedded prophecy. This is divine revelation and it's another proof an internal proof that shows that this book that we hold in our hands mm. is God's very word. Yeah. And I just, I just, I was like, Lord, what have you done? Yeah. How you have embedded not only in prophecies like Isaiah 53, but in these gospel pictures yeah. that you've given us as nuggets, then they all, all these gospel pictures, they predict Christ, they portray Christ and they preach Christ. Mm. It's all about the gospel yeah. from beginning to end. Wow, wow, great. All right, Gospel Pictures of the Promised One in Genesis. That's the name of the book written by Dr. Katrina Forsyth. How can people get their own copy? Well, it is on Amazon. And I think if you type in on your bar there, Gospel Pictures of the Promised One in Genesis, it should come up. Now there's another book that Nancy Guthrie wrote that's called The Promised One. Mm -hmm. So that might come up first. <laughs> but if you put the whole name in there, not just you know Gospel Pictures, but the whole thing, Gospel mm -hmm. Pictures of the Promised One. Or if they want to, I, I'd be glad to do a signed copy I have like author's copies from Amazon and for a gift, a donation to CEF for any amount, mm. I'd be glad to, our office staff will just send a copy and I'll sign it for you and I'll put my name on it and you can save it. It might be worth five cents one day, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's CEF of Illinois.com is our website. Or if they want to, I can give you my email or okay. my phone number, whatever you want to do. I, 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 have, I have no secrets. So. All right. <laughs> so you'll see all that stuff is on the screen. That contact information is right there. You can also contact me right here at TV44. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, my email address is jbeck at wtlw.com. Let me know you're interested in getting a copy of this book, and I'll make sure I get you connected with Katrina. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Wow. So what's next? Um, we have about, like, one and a half minutes left available. What's next for you? You're going to go back to Illinois. You're going to start the fall season, and you mm -hmm. guys will be in the schools. Is that what's going to yes, happen? Yes, we're working on the on the fall ministry, and also Christmas is coming. It's it's not Christmas, and you know right now, but you know mm -hmm. we're we're looking forward to just any way that we can to have a gospel outreach to the children. We want to we want to do any we want to take advantage of every opportunity we can, any little gospel point that we can have, and even though. Christmas has really been losing over the years and, and a lot of children. I've had children in our Bible clubs, they raise their hand and they say, is that story that you told about Jesus and the manger and the shepherds and the angels, is that really true? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're starting to really lose our foundational mm -hmm. understanding of even like simple Christmas mm -hmm. and what Easter is all about. And so we wanna do everything we can to get in, not just the schools, but in the communities and and anywhere, housing projects and so forth, like apartments and in sub suburbs as well. We want to go yeah. anywhere we can because children need to hear the good news of Christ. That's right. All right, Dr. Katrina Forsyth, State Director at Illinois Child Evangelism Fellowship. Thank you so very much oh, for being for with us me. and sharing all this great information. Okay. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Dr. Katrina Forces. She's truly an amazing woman whose heart and soul's desire is to share the love of Jesus with children everywhere. I want to leave you today with some scripture which focuses on Jesus and how much he loves children. Luke 18, 16. But Jesus called them to him saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. We here at TV44 also have a huge heart for children with a desire for everyone to hear the life-saving message of Jesus Christ. I'm Jennifer Beck. Thanks for watching this edition of In the Community.